Hello, this is your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, back for another episode of the History Comic Podcast, this time, the history of women in American comic books. Like all industries, the American comic book medium has mostly been considered a boy's game. While names like Jack Kirby and Stan Lee are commonly known, the many, fem- many uh, female cartoonists throughout the comic book's history are not so much, despite being a part of the industry from the very beginning. With these episodes, we are going to highlight the many talented women cartoonists throughout history and their place in the American comic book medium, and hopefully do a small part in getting their names more widely known. One of the first American women cartoonists was Rose O'Neill, who was born on June 25th in 1874 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, the daughter of William Patrick Henry and Alice Celia Sidney Smith O'Neill Mimi, who had two sisters and three brothers. Both her parents loved art and literature, which they passed on to their daughter. Soon, O'Neill showed her love and talent for writing and art from a very young age, and at 13, she won an Omaha newspaper contest with a drawing titled Temptation Leading to an Abyss. However, when the judges saw that she was a 13-year-old girl, O'Neill was forced to prove that she could actually draw it before before they would give her the award. At 15, she sold her first story to Truth Magazine, which began a career that would spawn 50 years. Soon, she was providing illustrations for the local Omaha publications Excelsior and The Great Divide, using the income to help provide for her her large family, as her father struggled to make ends keep as a bookkeeper. O'Neill would later attend the Sacred Heart Convent School in Omaha. To help further her career, Rose O'Neill's father took her to New York City in 1893. On the way, they stopped at the World Columbian Exposition in um, Chicago, where O'Neill saw many of the beautiful paintings in person that she had only seen in her father's books. Upon arrival in New York City, O'Neill lived with the Sisters of St. Regis and their New York convent, with the nuns even accompanying her to publishers as he pitched her illustrations in a 60-page portfolio. Soon, O'Neill was finally at work, and on September 9, 1896, her her illustrations appeared in True True Magazine, making Rose O'Neill America's first published female cartoonist. She would later join the staff of Puck Magazine, becoming its only female member. O'Neill would later illustrate her second husband's, Harry Leon Wilson's. She was previously married to Gary Latham from 1892 to 1901 books and would write her first novel, The Loves of Edoui, in 1904. They would later divorce in 1908, but in 1909, O'Neill created the, the QPs, which first appeared in the Ladies' Home Journal, Women's Home Companion, and Good Housekeeping. According to O'Neill, the Cupid-like characters, whose name is derived from the Cupid, the, the Roman god of love, came to her in a dream, which she would adapt to the form one of the f- three, one to three-page stories accompanied by verse, an early form of comic strip storytelling. The characters would gain instant success, making O'Neill world renowned in the process. In 1912, J.D. Kestner, a German porcelain company, produced a series of QP dolls, with O'Neill supervising their production at the Pran and Walterschan. Other versions of QPs were produced in the celluloid and composition, becoming one of the first examples of comic strips being merchandised. It also led to O'Neill becoming the highest paid female illustrator of the world at the time, eventually amassing a fortune of $1.4 million, nearly $36 million today's dollars. Despite her success, O'Neill continued to work producing the strip Dottie Darling for the Women's Home Companion and ads for Jell-O. By all accounts, Rose O'Neill was an independent-minded woman advocating for women's rights and having divorced twice in a time when even once was considered heresy, but remained popular to her dying day, hosting parties at her Greenwich Village home to a mostly bohemian crowd. In fact, the song Rose of Washington Square was inspired by her. She died on April 6, 1944, drawing the QPs into her death, and was interred at her family's homestead in Missouri, called Bonnie Brook. In 1997, the site was listed in the National Re- Registry of Historic Places. Truth Magazine seemed to specialize in discovering new female talent, as Grace Gibby was 18 when she sold her first magazine story to them, the previous year making a living selling cars for two fifty dollars a dozen, featuring QPs and Pretty Women. Born on October 14, 1878, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, she would later produce Toodles, her first story as Grace Wildersham, her married name from her first husband, and then as Grace Drayden, from her second husband, W. Drayden, where she did stories like The Strange Adventures of P- Pussy Pumpkin and Her Chum Toodles, The Adventures of Dolly Drake and Bobby Drake in Storyland, which was written by her sister Margaret, Dolly Drizzle, Dolly Darling, and so forth. 
As you can see, Dolly would become a popular term in comic books at the time, and though the title changed, it was essentially told the same story of cherubic kids and their adventures. In 1909, Grace and her sister Margaret did Turtle of a Captain Kiddo, along with the work on Youth Companion. Soon, despite Rose O'Neill being unofficially dubbed the Queen of Cute for creating the Cupies, Drayden was getting the title, especially when she created the Campbell's Kids for the Campbell Soup Company in 1904. Drayden would later create Dolly Dimples and Bobby Bounce for the Sunday Passage, only to have it canceled in 1932. She fell down and out for a few years until successfully selling the Pussycat Princess in 1935 with writer Ed Anthony. Sadly, Drayden would die of a heart attack the next year on January 31st, 1936. Ruth Carroll and Ann Anthony, drawing and writing respectively, would take over the Pussycat Princess in 1947. The Campbell Kids will remain iconic advertisements for decades afterwards, while Drayden's art style is considered an influence on the Japanese shoujo manga aimed at young girls genre. Her sister, Margaret Gabby Hayes, would attempt her own strip in 1908, writing and drawing Ginny and Jack, also the little dog Jap, though it was also apparent she didn't have her sister's grace's artistic ability. In 1895, the Yellow Kid would make his debut in the comic strip Down in Hogan's Alley in Joseph Poetzer's New York World newspaper. Seven months later, the paper experimented with new yellow ink, which they then painted the kid, which thus was born what is considered the first comic strip. The Yellow Kid by Richard F. Alcott. Within six years of the birth of the comic strip, women's cartoonists were already making their appearance, with Lewis Quarrell's Buns, Puns, and Grace Cosson's Tin Tan Tales for Children, which both appeared in the New York Herald in 1901, along with Agnes Rippier III's The Filibusters, which ran into the Philadelphia Press. Among those comic strip artists was Fanny Y. Corley, who was born on October 18, 1877 in Waldegan, Illinois. She was 14 when she attended art school in Helena, Montana, and later attended the Metropolitan School of Fine Arts in New York City, but had to leave school early due to money. At the time, she was living with her brother, his wife, and her invalid sister, and with their mother having died of tuberculosis when she was just 10. As a result, money was tied in the family, and despite being a top student at the school, Corey had to leave to help support her family. This led Corey to take up her portfolio to Harper's Magazine, but was rejected, with the editor claiming that the paper didn't hire beginners. She later moved to Montana to work as an illustrator and start a family of her own in 1902. There, Corey produced six books from 1905 to 1913, along with producing ads for Ivory Soap. However, her precedent was for raising her family, and she wouldn't return to work full-time until the 1920s. In 1916, Corey would briefly produce the strip Ben Bolt, a single panel cartoon parody of the song Do You Remember Sweet Alice, Ben Bolt? But by 1925, needing to put her eldest child through college, it just prompted her to return to comics permanently with two single-panel strips. Her first were Other People's Children and then Sunny Savings in 1920 under the Ledger Syndicate. In 1935, Sunny Savings moved to the King's Features Syndicate, along with Corey producing the Depression-era strip Little Miss Muffet, about the orphan Millie Muffet and her dog, a strip that would run until 1956 when Corey had to finally retire due to her failing eyesight at the age of 76. Miss Muffet was so popular with even a comic book from 1948 to 1949. Fanny Y. Corley would later move to Camino Island and still find time to paint until her death at the age of 94 on July 28, 1972. Jean Moore did Sally Slick and her surprising Aunt Amelia in 1902, having previously done Easy Edgar. She also produced Dolly Dimper for the Poetster newspaper. Amelia would do a departure from early comic books as it featured a, a devilish and angelic child children often speaking in baby talk. Moore would also produce a more traditional strip, Easy Edgar in the Philadelphia North American in 1903, though it was notable for the title character being clad in skirts and petticoats, often mistaken for a girl. Kate Crew did The Angel Child in 1902, and in 1911 did The Sacred Night of the Franchise for Women Equal Rubbish, a political satire for the New York American poking fun at the anti-suffrage movement. Marjorie Oregon was born on December 3, 1886, and in 1902 would become the first woman on the art staff of William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal, at the age of 16 no less. She would create Reggie and the Heavenly Twins, about a poor boy Reggie, always trying to win the affection of his two beautiful twin sisters, and Strange, what a difference a mere man makes, which took us any feminist bent. However, upon marrying her husband, Robert Henry, in 1908, she devoted most of her life to orchestrating their social life, though she still produced paintings and cartoons from time to time. 
One of the most significant cartoonists during this time was Neil Brinkley, who was born on September 5, 1886 in Denver, Colorado. Despite having no formal art training, Brinkley would demonstrate her skills at a young age till the illustration of the garden parties. Later, after dropping out of high school at 16 years old, she was hired to Denver Post for $7 a week and would later go to the Denver Times, the Rocky Mountain News, and then four years later went to the New York Journal when uh, she was discovered by the paper's publisher, William Randolph Hearst, and its editor, Arthur Brisbane. Despite being barely in her 20s, he was convinced to move to Brooklyn, New York, where she produced large illustrations with commentary for the journal on their daily basis. Another of her task was working as a courtroom illustrator for the journal, such as in 1907, when she illustrated Henry K. Thaw's murder trial, who was accused of killing famed architect Stanford White in a lover's quarrel over Thaw's wife and White's ex-lover, Emily Nisbet. Nesbitt, a former model, was perfect for Brinkley's drawings, which became famous for depicting numerous beautiful women, dubbed the Brinkley Girls, throughout the 1920s. These illustrations became popular with young women at the time. This was set the style for the era when she did The Fortunes of Flossie, The Romances of Glorietta, and The Adventures of Prudence Prim, which also inspired products as the Brinkley Hair Wavers and the new Nell Brinkley Bob Curler at Nine Cents a Card. During World War I, Brinkley produced the serial comic Golden Eyes and Their Hero, Bill, about Golden Eyes, her soldier boyfriend, Bill, and their faithful dog, Uncle Sam. When Bill was deployed to France, Golden Eyes volunteered as an ambulance driver, and the two briefly reunited during the war, having numerous adventures together. Running from March of 1918 to February of 1919, the comic is notable not just for being patriotic, but for featuring a proactive heroine who rescues Bill as much as he rescues her. This would be, the, be in style of Brinkley's last work, Heroines of the Day, a Sunday series published in 1937 which highlighted women in many non-traditional roles of the time, from police detective to soldier. Despite her success and popularity, Brinkley lived a quiet personal life and would later retire in 1937 at the age of 51 though occasionally would still draw books in some magazines. Neil Brinkley would died in 1944. Neil Brinkley would inspire many other artists dur- during her four-decade-long career, being dubbed the Queen of Comics at the time. One of the notable female cartoons was Ethel Hayes, who was born on March 13th of ni- 1892 in Billings, Montana. In high school, she was an illustrator at the high school newspaper and later studied at the Los Angeles School of Art and Design in the Arts League in New York, working her way to becoming a fine arts painter. However, the outbreak of World War I derailed her studies, which led her to, do, to teach art to disabled veterans, who naturally liked her drawings of pretty women. During this time, Hayes met a group of students interested in cartooning, which sparked her passion as she took up a correspondence course at the Landon School of Illustration and Cartooning. The director of the school, Charles H. Landon, was so impressed with her work he showed it to the editor of the Cleveland Press, who hired her, doing work on such strips as Vic and Ethel, a flapper-themed strip that was a mix of satire and social commentary. From there, she became a nationally syndicated cartoonist within a year with Ethel, a satirical social commentary strip, and Flapper Fanny Says, a single panel strip, and by 1928 was producing Sunday Pages. Hayes would later create Mary Ann in 1936. She would pass the strip on to Vendra Klossman, who infused the strip with a deco style, while Hayes would continue to work on illustrating children's books and paper dolls, notably the Raggedy Ann and Andy. Hayes would pass away on March 19, 1989, at the age of 97, having left the legacy of being one of the most popular cartoonists in the 1920s, along with helping make the flapper style so popular at the time. Hayes would pass on the Sunday color pages in the flapper Fanny Says to Gladys Parker, after her second daughter was born in 1931. Parker was born on March 21, 1908, in Tawanda, New York, a self-taught artist, which she did when she had broke her leg using the practice to pass the time. Parker eventually became still enough to, to, for her cartoons to sell in local magazines. At 18, Parker moved to Manhattan to attend the Trapaganda School of Fashion, graduating in 1928 with a degree in illustration. After graduation, she started her career at the New York Graphic, doing the comic strip May, May and Junie, later moving to the United Features for two years, and then the newspaper Enterprise Association for seven, before getting the opportunity to do Flapper Fanny Says. Under Parker, the single panel strip took on a more cartoony style where the lead characters started to resemble Parker in appearance, not uncommon among many cartoonists. She did a series of comic strip ads for Lux Soaps in the 1930s as well. Parker had previously done Gay and Her Gang becoming a, before becoming a cartoonist. By the late 1930s, she moved to a higher-paying syndicate where she created Mopsy, which is also modeled after herself in 1939, while Flapper was passed on to an artist with a single name, Sylvia. 
During World War II, Parker created the strip Betty G.I. for the Women's Army Corps, while also drawing Russell Flynn's Flying Jenny about the adventures of the female aviator from 1942 to 1944. Parker took over the newspaper strip Flying Jenny when the regular artist Russell Keating went into service in 1943. Jenny was a blonde aviatrix battling the Nazis during World War II. After the war, Parker's Mopsy continued to grow in popularity, reaching 300 papers while also getting a comic from St. John's in 1947 and the pageant of comics. Before getting her own two years later, which ran for 19 issues from February of 1949 to September of 1953. Before her death on April 28, 1966, at the age of 58 from, from lung cancer, Parker would be accepted into the Society of Illustrators and the National Cartoonist Society, having retired Mopsy with her in 1965. Glass's Mopsy also helped with the war effort by joining WAC a, a, as a WAVE and, and as an Army Air Nurse and a member of the Motor Corps. Inez Townsend did Greta Gertie in 1904 and 1905, and later, under the name Inez Tridbit, did Snooks and Snicks, the mischievous twins, another strip of mischievous twins getting in trouble. Mary A. Hayes produced Kate and Carl, the Cranford Kids, from 1911 to 1912. The name of Cranford was an in-joke to the editor, Fred Crane, of the Philadelphia North American Comic Syndicate, who came from Cranford, New Jersey. Crane is notable for also publishing Gene Moore, Ines Tidbit, Gracie Dalton, and Catherine Price, and as a result, probably published more women cartoonists than anyone else at the time. Virginia Hewitt was born in Dallas, Texas in 1899, where she met her husband, Coons William Hudson. Studying at the Art Institute of Chicago, she changed her last name to Hugot when she created the Gentleman Preferred Blondes in 1926, her first comic strip, which she sold at the Bell Syndicate. Then Hugot did Babes in Society in 1927, a full-color Sunday strip in 1928, where she did Campus Capers and then the Floors fly- Fling. In 1929, she did Miss Aladdin and the Lux Soap Ads. In 1936, Hugot produced Dossie, Dizzy Dolly's Ditters and later took over Skippy for Percy Crosby in 1937. In 1944, she took over O Diana as Virginia Clark from the artist uh, Don Flowers. It was originally an adventure strip under Flowers, but under Clark, it became a train strip. Doc Cochran was born in Toledo, Ohio in 1901, with her father being the editor of Toledo B, brother a cartoonist, and sister and other brothers also cartoonists. She had already become the aunt of Martha Blanchard, who did the single panel cartoons in Collier's in the Saturday Evening Post, and sister in law to Frederick Oper, creator of Alphonse and Gaston and Happy Hooligan. Naturally, with a family like that, it was only a matter of time before she became a cartoonist herself, as Cochran did Dot and Dodo and Me and My Boyfriend. All this ended, though, when she married in 1927 and moved to England, where she illustrated children's books instead. Dorothy Ooper did Annabelle, a single panel strip that first appeared in December of 29, 1929, as part of the women's page of the newspaper Enterprise Association Every Week section. The series was a humor strip revolving around the title character's social life and was even reprinted in the comic book The Funnies. Virginia Krausman would take over this strip in March of 1936, with the series lasting to October 15th of 1939. Marjorie Henderson was born on December 11, 1904, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Growing up with two sisters, they would draw cartoons and birthday cards and other family events while gro- as children. However, it was Marjorie who demonstrated the true talent, and by age eight, she had become talented enough to sell cards to her friends. By 16, Marjorie Henderson sold her first professional work to the public ledger, and soon her work was appearing in numerous other human magazines and periodicals, such as Collier's, Life, and Judge. By the late 1920s, she was going by the name Marge with her first syndicated strip, The Boyfriend, which ran from 1925 to 1926. Marge also created Dashing Dot around the same time, and like The Boyfriend, both starred female leads. Her big break came in 1934, though, when, she, when the Saturday Evening Post requested Marge created a strip to replace Carl Anderson's Henry, which featured the hijinks of the mute young boy. In response, she created Little Lula, this time starring a little girl, as Marge felt she could get away with more stunts than a boy. The first single-panel cartoon of the series appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on February 23, 1935, featuring the title character serving as a flower girl at the wedding, but instead of throwing flowers, she's, uh, she's throwing banana peels, which will naturally lead to comic effect. The single panel format would continue in the post until, ni- until December 30th, 1944, and then continue as a regular comic strip. Unusual for the time, Marge retained the rights to Little Lulu, and as a result was able to benefit from the nuclear- lucrative marketing deals involved with the character, such as with Kleenex, for which Little Lulu will become the product's first mascot. 
Marge ceased drawing the strip herself in 1947, only doing occasional work for the advertisements. But by 1950, it was nationally syndicated through Chicago Tribune New York News World Syndicate. While maintaining creative control, Marge would see Lil Lou moving the comic books, cartoons, greeting cards, and, and more, with the strip even being translated in numerous languages for international release. Buell would, would eventually sell the rights to Lil Lulu in 1971 to Western Publishing when she retired. She would pass away on May 30th, 1993 from lymphoma in Ohio at the age of 88. To date, her original art is still highly prized, with the original panel for Little Lulu selling for $9,200 $9, in 2005. Faye King was born in March of 1889 in Seattle, Washington. Noted for being an adventurous woman for the time, she was one of the first in her area to own an automobile. As a cartoonist, she would put herself in the strips, often taking a personal nature, which appeared in the Denver Post, the San Francisco Examiner, and the New York uh, Evening uh, Journal. Having a colorful personal life helped as well, notably when she married lightweight boxing champion Oscar Matthew Battling Nelson in 1913, only to have a widely covered divorce in 1916. In 1918, King produced a comic inspired by the ordeal, My Favorite Post, and then stripped Maisie in 1924, along with Girls Will Be Girls from 1924 to 1925. King even appeared on film in 1924 with the comedy The Great White Way, which also featured f fellow cartoonists Windsor McKay and George McManus. Despite such a colorful early life, King would die in obscurity and with the date of her death believed to be sometime around 1954. And with that, we will conclude that uh, list of short biographies of the numerous uh, women cartoonists throughout the uh, American comic book medium. But join me again next week as we continue more with an even larger and greater list as these cartoonists move on from the comic strips to adventure the comic books themselves. My name is Mark McCrane. I'm the author of The Best Saturdays of Our Lives. I'm Dan Klink, co-host of The Best Saturdays of Our Lives podcast. The Best Saturdays of Our Lives features programming trends from the 1966 television season all the way through the last hurrah of the early digital age of the 1990s. On the show, if it's animated, we talk about it. Order your signed copy today at tbsool.com. And listen to the podcast at esonetwork.com and all podcast platforms. And now it is March 7th, 2024, time for the favorite comic book of the week. Ultimate X-Men, number one, by Peach Momoko, which is a great relaunch of the series. This time takes on an interesting perspective taking place in Japan, in which uh, Hisako uh, Ikika uh, finds out that she's being haunted by what she thinks is the spirit of a dead classmate. She's, basically, she's a young uh, teenage girl in the growing up in Japan, and of course, uh, X-Men fans know her as the character Armor, and while she's having these weird spiritual visions, her Armor mutant powers start to develop in a very cool way. Momoko was just as great. This is right up her being a Japanese artist, and she evokes a lot of great Japanese style and folklore into this story, where it feels really different. This is not like anything that even the Ultimate books are doing, where everyone's doing their own neat takes. This is such a unique take, perfect for Momoko's style. This has a great look to it. It's almost creepy. It's like it reminds you a lot of like the the, that gr the more edgier uh, manga you get in the anime you get overseas. It's kind of almost like a horror film at times. It does deal with some adult subject matter like uh, suicide and so forth. So probably not for younger kids, but overall just a great read in general. And her art is, of course, gorgeous. And yeah, the, the Ultimates have uh, been so far been knocking out the part. Ultimate Spider Man, which I absolutely love. Because we get, you get Peter and uh, Mary Jane with kids. What, what's not to love about that? And then you have Ultimate uh, Black Panther, which is more straight down the line, but still a great read. And now we have this. This is just a unique read. Really swinging for the fences here and just great all around. Highly recommended. So yes, uh, definitely check out uh, Ultimate X number one. And with that, we will conclude uh, just for a retelling of the archives of the history of female characters, creators in the uh, comic books. Join me again next week as we explore even more um, uh, the second part of this uh, classic episode. And, and of course, in celebration of uh, March, which is Women's History Month. So in uh, my line of work, I'm going to deliver um, a few classic uh, ep episodes dealing with that, too. Well, I guess I can't. I'll call it like, it's more archives. I can't really... Uh, it's kind of pretentious to me to call my, my, my show's classics. It's just... Yeah. That's why, I, that's why I call her comic books. Yeah, now I'm just rambling. But uh, with that, join me again next week for the second part of this uh, s series. Until then, go ahead and enjoy some good comic book, and definitely check out Ultimate X number one. That, that might be a true classic already.